we got uh, a lot of awesome things happening here at Hope Summit Christian Church, and and uh, I got a couple of them here that I want to put some emphasis on. Again, as always, um, your bulletin is has all this information in there. Um, it's just sometimes, well, I don't read the bulletin sometimes, and uh, I have to like approve it sometimes. So like, if that tells you anything about those of us who show up every single Sunday. And uh, we were handed this awesome little piece of paper, and then we kind of glance at it and then kind of put it aside. There's some great information in there, so I'd love for you to read that thing and, and take a look at what's going on. But uh, one of the things I want to put some emphasis on is that on every, every first Thursday, um, we're going to come here around 6.30 and just spend some time in prayer. We've been in this prayer series for a while, and uh, September 1st, we're going to have another opportunity for, for all you guys to come in and uh, just spend some time praying together. It's just a nice opportunity th- on a Thursday evening to, to come together, to kind of push aside all the stuff that's going on, and just spend some time in prayer. And I, I bring uh, like topics and things that we can spend our time on or whatever, and we kind of put a little bit of music on in the background, you know, and make it nice and comfortable, and we just spend some time in prayer. And, and uh, the people, it's amazing how um, the people who have come how consistently as, as I'm walking out, it really doesn't take me a lot of time to prepare for something like this, but they're just shaking my head. Thank you so much. I really need this tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is, this is exactly what, where I needed to be tonight. And so, so I just want to ask you and invite you that uh, you know, this Thursday, I'd love to have you join us uh, for our, first, uh, our, our, our September prayer meeting together at 630 here. So uh, second thing I want to remind you of is uh, our one-for-one offering. Um, uh, we want to remind you that every single week we challenge you guys to bring one extra dollar. That if every one of us brought one extra dollar, uh, we can use that money then to make a really significant impact in the lives of someone who is far from Jesus. All the money that's put in that little bank back there, when we all put in one extra dollar, is used to help someone who is in need, who is outside of our church. So it's a way for us to, to do that. Now there's a, there's a gal who is... Uh, oh, last week, by the way. Uh, last week, by the way, you raised... a. Uh, uh, Oh, guys, I didn't write that around the amount. Do you remember, Rick? It was somewhere around, I think it was close to $150, $200 or so. That's just my guess. Okay, it's just my guess. But uh, overall, we were, we, it, was just, it was close to about $500 that we were able to raise for the family who, um, whose uh, the, the father had jumped out of a moving car. And, uh, and, he, his, and uh, he had died from his injuries and left behind uh, four four small children, okay? So we are able to, to make a pretty significant uh, gift to that family uh, in their time of need. Now, this week, uh, every dollar that you guys give is going to go to a gal who's needing a new kidney. Now, she's, uh, she, she, she doesn't have a lot of money herself. She has, she has some insurance, but the insurance uh, isn't covering everything that she needs. And uh, so we are going to, every dollar we give is going to help take care of her. Uh, she has to stay at a hotel close by after the surgery so she can continue to go in and get checkups. Uh, because her insurance won't cover uh, her staying in the hospital that whole time, okay? So, so there's a hospital that's willing to give her a deal. I mean, a hotel that's willing to give her a deal while she makes her stay, uh, but she can't afford to stay in that hotel uh, on her own. So every dollar that we give is going to make sure that this gal, as she's been waiting to get a kidney now for a while, and uh, as this new kidney kind of adjusts to her body, uh, she's able to get the, the continued care that she's going to need. So every dollar that you give, um, as you drop it in there, is going to go to that. There's a family in our church who knows them, and they're going to be able to personally hand over the check and say, hey, Jesus loves you, and uh, so does our church. So that's a pretty cool pretty cool thing we get to be a part of. Um, our last announcement, actually, I have someone I'd like you to meet. Come on up, Jen. Uh, why don't you guys welcome to the stage Jen Nolan. There we go. Now, uh, Jen is one of our awesome children's ministry volunteers, and uh, we've asked her to come on up here. Come on up right here. Uh, we've asked her to come on up and just kind of share a little bit about uh, her experience in children's ministry. So, Jen, why don't you tell them, like, what, what got you into children's ministry? You know, what was the process of getting you in there? Is this on? Yeah, it's on. Okay. I'm a little nervous, so I brought, <laughs> I brought a cheat sheet just in case. And also, I told Pastor Jeff I tend to get a little long-winded. Um, like I'm doing right now. Me too. So I need to They're stop. used to that. <laughs> well, That's all good. Yeah, but you don't use these. That's true. Okay. That's true. So why did I start volunteering? Um, in 2006, I had come out of fairly a long season of sin in my life. I was um, a prodigal, uh, very, very good at it, and um, had um, started going back to church 
was rebaptized, and there was a need. Uh, someone had told me about a need in the children's ministry program and asked me if I would consider volunteering. So I considered it, and I thought about it. Uh, I thought about it for a while, and um, finally um, decided that yes, I would help. Okay. Now, were there any uh, hesitations on your part? You know, anything that was kind of like, well, I mean, children's ministry sounds great, you know, uh, and I know <laughs> they have a need. I mean, don't we don't we consistently talk about you know there's always needs that we have in children's ministry. Um, you know, is there any hesitations on your part or anything keeping you back from doing it? Um, at that, at that time, yes. Um, so I considered myself kind of a fairly new Christian, um, since I had been saved when I was five, but had never really understood what that meant. So my life as a Christian up until my, until 2006 basically was mm, odd. <laughs> it was a struggle. So... Um, I didn't feel qualified because of the um, recent events that had occurred in my life. I thought that um, I didn't really yet even understand um, the fullness of God's grace on my life at that time. Um, so there was that. <laughs> I don't have kids. So how on earth could I teach kids when I can't, you know, I thought, oh, I can't relate to them. I don't know. I don't understand. Um, I haven't had any practice other than babysitting when I was a kid. Um, and I guess I, I had no teaching experience either. Absolutely none. None. Okay. So when you're asked to do something that you're like, I, I have absolutely no experience in this, why would you even consider me? Yeah. Um, there's, there's probably a good reason behind being asked. Okay. So, so you've probably discovered that since then. Yeah. Uh, what keeps you coming back? And I just got to say, um, just for the record, um, Mandy, our children's pastor, brags on this gal all the time for what a wonderful blessing she is. And so obviously, something's right. You know, something's, something's, so tell us, like, what, what keeps you coming back every week? Um, well, I had to write this down. God blessed me when I stepped out in faith. And like I said, I didn't realize what I was, what was going on when it was happening. Um, I am only equipped through Christ and I wonder sometimes if I would have missed out on this if I had not stepped out of my comfort zone. Um, it was an absolute leap in faith. It was, okay, there's a need. I have no valid reason in light of God who is. Even in my limited view of who he was at that time, I knew that he was bigger and that he had saved me from so much that um, I wanted to be obedient to him. I wanted to love him back and please him. And if this was... I didn't even know, but I'm like, if this is what you need me to do right now, I'll do it, and I'll see. And <laughs> he blessed me immensely. Um, I truly believe that God gifted me with teaching, and he gifted me with exhortation to these little ones only because I stepped out in faith. Mm. I don't believe I had that gift until I stepped out, mm -hmm. and he opened the floodgates, the joy I have um, in knowing, knowing what I'm doing, what he wants me to do is amazing. The joy that he equips me, he equips me. I didn't do it, I didn't earn it, and yet he allows me to teach these little kids. And it's amazing. It's an amazing privilege and it is an honor, um, but it's also very serious and it's something that um, I don't take lightly because these are, these are little saints, and they're so important, and um, I just want to love on them like Jesus has loved on me and let them know how much he loves them, and no matter what, he always will. Mm. He always will. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jen. I know this wasn't necessarily very easy for you to come no, up and do, but okay. thank you. Let's give her a hand for being brave and coming on up here. Well, again, I can tell you, so what's so cool is to see her side of all this, you know, but on the, on the flip side of that, so that's one side of the coin, how she's seen her obedience to God and how, how that's, she's actually headed off to her classroom right now, that's where she's going, so uh, as she's been obedient to what God has called her to do, how, uh, maybe you've heard the saying before that, that God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called, right, like that, that, that there are just... Sometimes he just tells you to step out in obedience, and then he'll fill in the gap, you know, and Jen's seen that in her own life. But at the same time, like, 
I have kids in that classroom, you know, and I know the impact that, that she has had on my kids personally. And so, yeah, she's been blessed, but these children have been blessed through her in that way, you know. And so, guys, we have, we have some really cool opportunities for you to be a part of what Jen is a part of. Okay, and, and, and I know some of you hold back because you're like, well, I just don't know, you know, when I think children's ministry, I think Sunday school teacher, and I'm just not much of a teacher. Well, you heard her loud and clear. She, neither was she. But God gave her that ability because she said yes, right? And said God gave her what she needed. Some of you are thinking, well, I just don't know if I can relate to kids or get along with kids. Kids are playing Pokemon Go, and I don't even think I even could name one of the Pokemon, you know, like some of that stuff, right? But by the same time, she still also herself was very, she didn't feel like she was relatable, and yet she stepped out in faith anyways, and God was able, she was able to see how God was able to bless her and the kids in their ministry, Okay, so, so we have a, a thing called Jump on Wednesday nights. Uh, it's a really cool program where we are teaching kids to, to serve other people, to love other people in the name of Jesus. And uh, it's a really great program that we would love for your children to be a part of. Uh, your elementary age students would love to have them a part of what we're doing on Wednesday nights. But at the same time, we also need volunteers. And Mandy and Kristen, they take care of you guys. They set you up for success. You just kind of have to hang out with the kids and lead them through a project. They do all the teaching, so, you know, it's just kind of sitting around and, and helping the kids do it. So I got a couple of awesome volunteers right over here, and they're nodding their heads really big as I'm talking, because they love, it's such a great, such a great ministry. Now, at the same time, on Sunday mornings, uh, we have the, we're filling up the fall lineup, you know, as fall comes, so you will watch, guys, you'll watch our church start to fill up naturally, because people get into the rhythm of their normal day lives when it comes to school and that kind of stuff, and they start getting into their normal rhythm day everyday lives to come to church on Sunday again. Okay, so you're going to see us fill up, which means more kids, which means we need some of you who are willing to be obedient to God, step out in faith, and, and tell Mandy, you know what, Mandy, I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to do this, okay? Couple couple weeks a month, one month, a week, you know, uh, one week a month, whatever. Uh, we'd love to encourage you guys to be a part of something that, that God is going to use in the lives of these little saints, like she said, but he's also going to use it in your life as well, okay? So if you're interested in that, Mandy at HopeSummitChurch.com. Again, that information is in your bulletin. Uh, Mandy at HopeSummitChurch.com. Email her. She'll get you set up. Love for you to get involved in that way. I know she's called some of you, and you're kind of like, well, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. Do it. It's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. All right. I'm going to get nerdy with you guys again. I, 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 I know many of you don't necessarily keep up with some of my nerd talk. That's not my fault. You, you should keep up with this stuff. How many of you guys have uh, ever heard of Ender's Game? Have you ever heard of the book Ender's Game? This is by Orson Scott Card. Have, how many of you have read that book? Go ahead and be proud if you read that book. Well, not very many. How about the movie? A movie came out with Harrison Ford. How many of you guys have seen that? Ender's Game? Harrison Ford was in there. Fantastic movie. Okay. I can already see the blank stare starting to form. Well, give, give me a second here. Okay. Now, in the book, the premise is that Earth had, had been, in the past, had been attacked by this alien race. It's kind of, a, kind of this bug, insect-like alien race of uh, species, and they come in, and they, they, were, they were starting to destroy everything or whatever, and, and by a stroke of luck and genius, at the same time, they were able to push back this alien race, okay? And so, so then what happened was they started to prepare again for another war, because they expected these aliens to come back, all right? Now, um, what's interesting is this whole time that they're preparing for war again, um, I won't say too much, because I don't want to give too much away. If, you are, if you're interested that book, I'll tell you, it's very rare for me to pick up a book and read it, like, and be, not be able to stop reading it. That's one of the few books where I've ever done that. So if you're interested in any of the sci-fi stuff, even a little bit, pick up that book. It's worth your time. Anyways, um, so basically the idea is that they're preparing for the second war, but one of the characters realizes eventually that this alien race is trying to communicate with him. But there's a problem. They're like this insect alien race. And if you think about it, how do insects communicate? Like ants. Ants communicate like by scent. Bees communicate by dancing. Okay, they don't use vocalization. They don't have a form of writing. And so, so, so this, this alien race is very much kind of based on this kind of hive, kind of insect-like race of, of alien creatures. And they don't talk. They don't have a written language. They communicate in very different ways. And they're trying to communicate with one of the characters in the book. But again, when it comes to communicating... There's just, they, they, they don't have a way of going back and forth because it's just so very different. Now, again, I can tell that this isn't connecting with some of you, so I'll use my plan B. Helen Keller. 
I want, I want you to think about this for a moment. Let's say, okay, you come across someone who is blind and deaf. How do you communicate to them? How do you communicate to someone who cannot see you and who cannot hear you? I mean, what, like, so touch is a, is a part. I heard someone say touch, and that's eventually she was able to learn sign language by, by putting a hand in her palm and moving the hand that way. They were able to learn sign language in that way. But can you imagine if you came across someone and you had to try to explain to them a concept like love? How would you do that? Like, and, and actually, Helen Keller is so famous because of what she was able to overcome, what her tutor was able to overcome in her life, so she was able to actually communicate. Eventually, she actually would put, she, there's pictures of her online where you can see this, where she puts her hands on people's faces and her thumbs on people's lips, and she was able to learn to read their lips just by feeling how they were moving. Isn't that Unbelievable. Okay, but, but if you imagine you come across someone like that, you can't communicate. Now, I bring all this up, you know, trying to communicate with an alien species that you just can't communicate with, communicating with someone who can't see or cannot hear. I bring all this up because when it comes to prayer, I have heard this so many times from people who do not know Christ, people who are outside the church, and from very many Christians inside the church. When it comes to prayer, it kind of feels like I'm trying to communicate to an alien species that doesn't speak my language who doesn't use the same communicative skills that I use. It's like trying to talk to someone who's, who's blind or deaf. Okay, and actually, when it comes to people who are struggling with this whole concept of God in general, they often use prayer as a reason to stay away from God because they, can't, they say, well, I can't just sit across the table from God with a cup of coffee and talk to him. And therefore, it's really hard to have any kind of relationship with this person. When it comes to prayer, it's like trying to communicate with someone that I just I don't know how to talk to. And I know that's a frustration. I bring that up now because maybe you have felt that way before. And again, I know as a pastor of a church, it's incredible how often I meet people who have been going to church their whole lives. People who show up every single Sunday, and yet deep down, they're kind of afraid to let other people know this. Deep down, they feel this way. When it comes to prayer, it's like, it's like trying to talk to an alien species, Jeff. It's like, I can't, I don't know how to talk to them. Well, today we're going to look at a simple solution for this. Okay, we're going to look at, 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 at a way of communicating. And, and actually, I want to broaden this idea that prayer is so much more than a conversation. It goes deeper than just like a conversation where I say something and you say something and I say something and you respond. You know, like it goes so much deeper than that. And, and, and the way that we, that we bring some depth into our relationship with God and our communication with God is by adding in God's word to our prayer life. I'm going to talk about that a little, in a little bit here, but before we do, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for how clearly it speaks. Father, I pray that today your will would be done, your kingdom would come. I pray that, that what you want to happen in this room would happen, and that, Jesus, you would be known and glorified because of what we spend our time on today. Father, take the things out of my mouth you don't want me to say. Put in the things that I might be missing. I pray that, I pray that every single one of us would recognize the power of your word in, in our prayers. So, Lord, show us what it looks like to, to really communicate with you, to be in sync with you, Father. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Through your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, open up to uh, Psalm 19. Okay, Psalm 19. Now, as you flip over there, we're going to be looking at the words of, of, uh, of David. Now, in God's Word, and especially in the Old Testament, there's a lot of people that, uh, that are able to actually, like, communicate like God the way that I know so many people wish they could. You think about Moses, and it talks about how he was like a friend of God. He talked with God face to face. You think about Abraham and, and his interactions where God was actually talking to him. You think about Elijah, and when God was physically, he heard the voice of God speaking to him. So often that I look into God's word and we think, man, how awesome and easy and great would that be, right? How awesome and great would it be if I could just have God just say some words that I could physically hear so that I can understand exactly what he wants me to do. And it doesn't help that there's some examples in God's word of people actually getting that kind of treatment, right? But at the same time, there's a bunch of people who never had that experience with God, and yet their prayer life and their ability to communicate and be in sync with God was absolutely astounding. And David is one of them. Now, I'm using David again this week because last week we learned a little bit about David, about how he's been through all kinds of nasty stuff. You know, the, the king of Israel, before he was king, the king of Israel tried to kill him. And he was on the run for many, many, for, for, for quite a while. 
In fact, other people were dying on his behalf so that he could stay hidden. On top of that, he became king, and when he was king, he made some big mistakes. And, uh, and, and, uh, how, and then we get to see how he processed through that in some of the psalms that he wrote, okay? And then on top of that, after he was king for a while, his son started to try to take over, and, and they're disrupting the kingdom and causing some trouble in that way, okay? And so as we look at the life of David, we see a man who faced many, many troubles. If you look at the if you look at First and Second Samuel, you can read the story about David. But what's also is really cool is that we have the Psalms. We have Psalms that he wrote, and we can track some of those Psalms back to certain instances in his life, so we can understand what he was thinking and how he was processing these circumstances in his life um, as he was going through them. It's like getting to read his prayer journal, which is really really cool. Okay, so we know David was a man who faced many, many, many difficult things, and yet he never heard the voice of God. So how did he get through it? How how was David the guy that got to be called a man after God? own heart when he never actually physically heard the voice of God? Well, I think it's because of what he's going to share with us today in Psalm 19. We're going to start in verse 14. It says, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now there's two parts to this. Look at this. It says, may these words of my mouth, so the things that I am saying, the things that I am telling you, God, okay? When we think about prayer, so often we limit ourselves to thinking that this is prayer. I mean, if I tell you to get on your knees and pray, what are you thinking about doing? Well, you're thinking about, okay, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to say things to God, right? That's prayer. I'm going to sit down and, I'm gonna, and that's how we teach our kids to pray, don't we? We tell, okay, here's what you say to God and here's how you say it. And so often when they have these memorized prayers, you know, these things that they say over and over, and that's a good thing. But when we think about prayer, so often we stop with the words of our mouth, but see, David takes it another step. He said, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. The meditation of my heart. So here's the words of my mouth, but then here's the meditation of my heart. Well, what does that mean? What does the meditation of my heart mean? Now, culturally today, we have a different understanding of meditation, don't we? When I was a kid, I remember the first time I ever kind of ran into this. There was this special thing going on at my school, the elementary school. I can't even remember what was going on at the time, but I remember I came home with a bunch of, of swag, that's what we called it back then before it became swagger. But swag is stuff we all get, right? So we came home with all this swag. And it was like yo-yos and bubble gum. And, you know, they just, they, they sent us home with all this stuff. And one of the things that we got to take home was, uh, was some coloring sheets. And on one of it was a ninja, I remember I had a Ninja Turtle coloring sheet. And it was one of the Ninja Turtles in a, sitting down in, with his legs crossed and his fingers like this, you know, out on his knees and his eyes are closed and he's looking really serene. And I remember this specifically because my mom found this in my backpack and she pulled out, she said, well, where'd you get this? And I told her about this special event and how they sent us home a bunch of stuff or whatever. And I think, I, I think I, she got really upset and I think she even called the school because she's like, this is this Eastern religion stuff and I don't want this put in front of my kids, right? And so I grew up with this like idea that meditation was like this really bad thing right? This really evil thing because it's something that other religions do, right? And I was taught that all other religions, like, they're really, really evil and all that kind of stuff, right? So, but what's interesting is that in today's world, when you think of meditation, like, how many of you guys do yoga? Any yoga people in here? It's a real common thing for people, I can't do yoga, I just absolutely can't. I, I was doing P90X once, and yoga was the absolute worst thing. They show like these little like five, five foot nothing girls that weighed 95 pounds standing in these positions to holding themselves. You put them in a six foot five frame, yeah, you show them what, how difficult that'll be. Anyways, um, anyway, so, 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 so meditation is kind of a part of that where you, where you, where you kind of quiet your mind, you stop yourself for a while, you try to empty, you just try to focus on your breathing and quiet your life down for a moment. And that will kind of bring down your heart rate, it'll bring down, and, allow, and it kind of helps you alleviate stress. Now, there's something to this, right? Can we just all admit, like, there's something to this practice. If, if there wasn't something to it, people wouldn't do it, okay? There are benefits to stopping your life, closing off your mind for a while, cooling off your heart, and just taking a moment to relax, okay? That can lower your stress level. Stre lowering your stress level is really good. Physically-wise, it's really good for your body. We know how stress does a lot of negative things to your body, okay? So there's something to this. But see, the thing is, is that the meditation that David talks about, okay, takes it a step further, okay? It takes this idea uh, of, of, of quieting your life 
And it does something with a little bit more substance than just quieting your mind, right? Emptying yourself. Because the problem with just meditating to empty yourself, the moment you stand up from that, you're still f- facing the same stuff. You still have the same fears, the same anxieties. And, and see, David was able to take it another step. Okay, so what, what is that meditation that David is talking about? Well, I want to take you, now stay in, in Psalm 19 if you have your Bibles open. Now, I want to read to you Psalm 5.1. Okay, Psalm 5.1, it talks about meditation, but what's inter- today I'm actually going to read it in a couple different versions. Okay, we, we, we read the NIV version. I'm going to read it to you in a couple different versions here, starting with the King James. Okay, King James is the one that has all the these, the thys, the shouts, you know, all that, the old school language. Listen to what it says. It says, give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Okay, so here's this idea again, consider my meditation. Well, what is that? Well, if you actually go to Psalm 5.1 of the NIV, which is what we normally read around here, it's, listen to my words, Lord, consider my lament. Isn't that interesting? Isn't, the, isn't lament a little bit different? Oh, we got the wrong one up there on the screen there. Okay, so, so the NIV is, listen to my words, Lord, consider my lament. And then it says in the NASB, which is what we had to use in in Bible college, because it was the most literal translation of the Bible. It says, give words to my, give ears to my word, O Lord, consider my groaning. Okay, so what's interesting is that in three different versions, we have three different words being used. We have meditation, lament, and groaning. And in some, it's the word sighing. Give ears to my words, O Lord, consider my sighing. Okay, now the Hebrew words being used here right now, okay, are in, in, verse, in chapter 19 and chapter 5 here, is higagion, which means meditation, resounding music, or musing, and also the word hoghig, which means whisper, musing, or murmuring. Okay, so, so here are the Hebrew roots, words that are being used in this area. And so if you notice, David's prayer life goes far beyond just words being said. It goes to a different, a speaking of the heart. Lord, consider my groaning my sighing. Consider my lament. This is something that goes deeper than just what I can formulate in my mind, the words that come out of my mouth. It's this expression of the heart. It's this expression of the heart that goes deeper. I think it's okay sometimes when you pray to not have any words, but to just sit in front of God and sigh. To just, to just groan. To just to, to, to stop thinking you have to say something to God and just be in front of him. But this is such an abstract idea. This is such a difficult idea to kind of like get your hands around. So I want to I point out that if you notice, there are two words that are similar in, in the definition of those two different Hebrew words for meditation. The word is musing, okay? The idea of musing, to reflect, Okay, so it's taking time to stop and muse and reflect, you know, percolate a little bit of what you're seeing. Now, now here's the deal. Musing or reflection is very good, but it can also be aimless. I mean, if you just stopped your life for about 20 minutes and tried to quiet your mind for a little bit, and you tried to just kind of sit there and muse on what was going on in your life, don't you realize suddenly that you have 150 things you could sit and think about for a while? You got a hundred things that you could just stop and and consider and think about and really, you know, reflect on. And so musing without purpose is aimless. And you'll notice that what's interesting is that David didn't just sit around musing on whatever came to mind. He used God's word as a focus. Now, if you're in Psalm 19 still, go back to verse 9, and we're going to read this. I'm going to show you how this works, okay? Verse 9 says, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from a honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless innocent of great transgression. And then verse 14, which we read already, may these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So what's interesting is when David is talking about these words of my mouth and meditation of his heart, he refers to in verse 9, I mean in, in, uh, in verse 9 and verses 10, how important God's word is. 
He said, these words, these commandments that you've given us, they're righteous, they're good, these decrees that you've given us. So he's talking about the law of Moses. He's talking about basically his Bible at the time, right? The law that Moses had written down with all the, the things that God wanted them to do. He looks back and says, God, this is good. Your decrees are righteous. They are pure. They're sweeter than honey from a honeycomb. They're, they're, they're more pure than gold. And by them, your servants are warned. And we can know what's right. We can know what's wrong. It can keep us from sin. God, you, are, are, you, you recognize my sin. Please forgive me. This is basically what he's saying as he looks at God's word. And as he meditates on them, he recognizes that his life isn't necessarily on par with God. And so he comes to God in prayer, seeking for him to kind of put him in sync. Does that make sense? Like it, it, so, it, so David, what's interesting is David didn't just come to God in prayer and start rattling off things that he should say. You see, what David did was he took God's word and then he just sat on it for a while. He just sat and mused on it for a while. He sat and reflected on it for a while. And as he reflected on it for a while, he recognized that my life isn't necessarily in sync. And God, I need your decrees to set me straight. And I need your forgiveness to set me straight. And so as he reflected, it was natural for him to start talking to God. Did you notice that? As he read his word and reflected on it and meditated on it, then he started to speak to God about what he was reading. Okay, And then he found himself kind of becoming in sync with God. And that's what I think we should spend more time doing. Now, we've been talking all, all month about how important prayer is and having a prayer life with God and setting up the habit. And when we talk to God, understanding that he's our great father. And under, you know, we've talked about all this stuff and praying prayers that send us out of our comfort zone. We've been talking all this stuff about prayer. But, but guys, prayer is one little part of the picture. That if we would all learn to add God's word into our time, and meditate on it, to reflect, to let it percolate a little bit, then it would transform our prayer life. It would transform the way we talk to God, and eventually it would kind of start pointing out, like, man, as I look at God's word, I recognize I'm kind of off here. God, would you set me straight? And so when we think about prayer, and especially if you've ever had, or if you, you know, are going through a season right now where he feels like, man, I just can't seem to connect with God. When I come to pray to God, it's like, it's like I'm talking to an alien, an alien species. It's like talking to someone who can't hear me, can't see me. If that's you right now, maybe what you should add to your prayer life is some time with God looking at his word. Because what God has given us in his word, he tells us, but he's already told us what he wants from us. He's already told us in his word what he'd like us to spend our time on, right? He's already told us in his word uh, of, of how we can view ourselves, right? Of how we can see ourselves, how we can find our identity in him. So there's so many problems that we bring to God. He's like, God, I just want you to talk to me. I just want you to, to fill me in here. God, what should I do next? And he's kind of like, uh, I, I kind of wrote it down for you a long time ago. It's, it's been there the whole time. You know, it's been there the whole time. Just, just open it up and read it. It's just there. So, so I wanted. I have a, an idea. And I think it'll help us understand this concept a little bit. But I have some, some gals who are going to help me out here. Um, David was a musician, right? We know this about David. That when you read the Psalms, uh, it's like you know, it's like we get to open up his prayer journal. But it's also like this. We also get to read um, his his uh, his prayer journal in the form of poetry and, and, and music is, you know, and, and so many actually of the songs that we sing even on Sunday, so many are inspired by the words of David, okay? So, so I want to, again, I want to show you the, the word for meditation, higagion. It means meditation, resounding music, and musing. Did you just catch that second one? That meditation was also used for, for our words of resounding music, okay? So that kind of got me thinking, that when it comes to prayer, that it's limiting to think, well, prayer is just a conversation between me and God. I think it goes to something a little bit more than that. So, so Betsy here on the piano, okay, she's going she's gonna to start playing a song. Now, this song, this song that she's playing, let's say that song represents God's word, okay? It's a song that spans the ages, 
It's a song that goes across all cultures. And it's a song that will continue playing far beyond your life. It was being played thousands of years ago. And a thousand years from now, this song is never going to change. It's a beautiful song that gives us direction in life. It's a beautiful song that gives us peace and joy. It's God's love letter to you. It's a beautiful thing when you get into God's word. It's like a consistent song that we can always rely on. And it's always being played. It's just if you want to sit down and listen to it, right? It's just if you want to pull, sit down and actually pull the sucker out and actually spend some time reading it. Now, this is, this is where it's going to get hard. <laughs> when we come to God in prayer, when we come to God in prayer and we don't spend time listening to the song, getting into his word and spending time with him, very often it's like us coming in and playing our own song. And this is what it sounds like. It doesn't sound very good, does it? I mean, it's kind of okay. It's kind of okay, but honestly, like, uh, uh, no, that doesn't sound very, okay, you can stop. It's painful. Okay. Okay, so, so when we come to God in prayer on our own, okay, when we come to him on our own, um, then that's like us just jumping into a conversation with God and just saying what we want to say. Now, I will, be, I, will admit, I will admit that I am very guilty of this. I'm very, very guilty of this. I'm very guilty of like just jumping into prayer, not considering you know, what God has been saying to me or even wanting to listen, but just like, okay, God, here's my problems. Okay, God, here's the difficulties I'm going through. And I just start rattling off these things. Or here's what I need, God. This is what I need right now. This is my trouble. And, and that's what it sounds like, I think, to God when we do this. We just come in and just start rattling off our own little song here, okay? But also, something else that I think I know that I am really, really guilty of doing is allowing the distractions of God's life, uh, of, of life to get in the way of me being able to talk to God. So it's kind of like what I did here. I put headphones here in Rachel, and I'm going to play a really loud, obnoxious song. Sorry. And she's going to try to play along as she has headphones in her ear, okay? <laughs> so go ahead and play. She can't hear me right now. So she's trying to play along with the song right now. Because she has the music in front of her, right? She kind of knows what the song is supposed to sound like. Knows even how she's hesitating. She's not playing as, as smoothly because she's got this loud, blaring music in her ears right now. Okay, we can stop. <laughs> I put on literally the hardest song that I could find, the loudest, most obnoxious song I could find. Now, when we come to God in prayer, okay, but we're still allowing the distractions and the busyness of God's word into our life. I mean, uh, why did I say the busyness and distraction of God's word? That's exactly the opposite of what I'm trying to say. When we allow the busyness and the distraction of life, of the busyness of this world to be in our ears when we try to come and talk to God, it's like trying to play the song, but just with these loud headphones in our ears, okay? So the point, the point of all this is that there's this song that's always being played. And if you and I would just stop life for a moment, kind of like meditation, like when we think of it in a, kind of the modern terms, like if we would just slow down, a little bit, and if we would just stop and listen to the song, kind of find our place, eventually, eventually we'll kind of recognize, okay, this is how I can get in tune with that. This is how I can get into rhythm with that. And that sounds about right, right? And that's the way it's supposed to be. If you and I would just stop, and listen to God's word. Spend some time quieting our lives. Not just jump into a list of, this is what I want, this is what I need. I think our prayer lives go beyond just a conversation and it turns into something where we are syncing up with God. We're syncing up with, with, with the God who created this world for a certain way, God who created us to live a certain way. And when we start living that way, something is just right. And I have found in my life, when I am in sync, when I have actually spent time reading God's word, getting into what it says, stopping and pondering and, and, and reflecting on what it actually means for my life, and then I start to talk to God, I know my prayers feel a lot more like this. 
There's a lot more peace. There's a lot more satisfaction. There's a lot more joy. And I walk away from that time of prayer feeling satisfied and not wondering if I just threw up some random thoughts into the air. And so maybe if you're struggling with your prayer life, it's because you're missing a piece. Adding in God's word and then reflecting on it and then talking to God. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Let's give them a hand. Didn't they do great? I left my phone over here. I still have my notes up there. So, so how do we do this? Real simple. We've got a few minutes left. Real simple. How do we do this? Okay. What does it look like practically to take God's word, meditate on it for a while, and then put my prayer life in that way? By the way, um, I've talked to a few of you, and it's been really cool. Um, you've been showing me your prayer journals. Some of you have been keeping prayer journals long before we asked you guys to do it. By the way, who has your prayer, prayer journals? Let's see them. Go ahead and wave them up. You got your prayer journals here? Okay. Um, well, some of you have shared, some, of the, some people in our church have shared with me uh, the prayer journals that they've had before. And what's really, really interesting, those who are in the habit, who were in the habit before we started this series, it's incredible. Every single one of them has scripture inside of their prayer journal. They have found, okay, and I think this is part of the key to maintaining a good habit of prayer in your life. They have found the power of reading God's word, spending time percolating and reflecting on it, and then that being a part of their prayer life. And that extended that habit in their life, made it far, that prayer time far more meaningful, and it's something that they are still in long before we ever started talking about this, okay? So I think that's, that's an important point. Now, now, so practically, how do we do this? First thing, you got to get into a, a, pra- a good habit, Okay, uh, this is a discipline. This is something that you're not naturally going to fall into. You have to be intentional about this. We talk about it, hope some how we want you to be having these personal disciplines in your life. We use that word discipline very, very carefully because it's something that you have to, you, you have to like kind of make yourself do it for a while. But uh, again, if you weren't here at uh, the end of at the end of July, um, I had an entire sermon that talked about setting up a good ha- new habit in your life. Okay, so if if you you recognize, yeah, I want to pray, I want to spend more time in my word, but I just, I really have a hard time getting it started and keeping it going. Go back to the sermon. It's online. You can go find it online. It's on our website, or you can go to our Vimeo account, and you can find it there. Go back and listen to that sermon, because God's word has told us how to set up good habits in our life. So use that to help you set up some good habits and getting into the just consistent habit of doing this. And mine, every time I lay down my kids, that's my cue to get into the routine of spending some time in prayer, and I've been adding in reading God's Word, okay, into that, and so, and that's before I go into my normal stuff of kind of relaxing from the rest of the day, okay? So it's been a good habit-forming moment for me in my life. So you got to figure out what that looks like for you, and that sermon can help you. So that's the first thing. I, I know I keep referring back to that, but I know that some of you, again, you agree with everything I'm saying. You just haven't done the practical work of setting up a new habit in your life. So I'm going to keep referring you back to that because it can be very useful to you setting up a good habit. The second thing, the second thing that will help you reflect on God's word, okay, to, to meditate on God's word, is the word soap. Now, if you have your, if you have your, uh, if you have your your prayer journal, I want you to write this down in your prayer journal, okay? I want you to write this down. SOAP. This is an acronym that can help you get into your word and meditate. It's simple. Every day, write what is your scripture that you're reading, okay? So S is for scripture. I think I have a, this should be on a slide. Do we have this, Billy? Right? So we don't have that, okay? So you're just going to have to hear it from my own mouth here. Okay, so, so SOAP. Scripture Okay, so that's the first thing you do. Will you, what is the scripture that you're reading? Now, if you're having trouble getting into scripture, if you're not sure what to start reading, guys, I, I use an app. It's a Bible app. And even if you don't have a smartphone, you can just go to their website. Okay, you can just go to their website. It's just Bible.com. And you go in there, and they have some really cool uh, plans that you can set up. Okay, and there's all these plans. Like, like here's all the devotional plans. There's tons of these things on here. Like if you need help reading your word, go in here and pick one that looks good. And daily, you can even have your phone set reminders for you to remind you to be praying at the time that you've set up as, a, as the discipline in your life to be praying. There it is. Scripture is the first one. The next one, O, is observation. 
after you read the scripture, just take a moment to write down, this is what I saw. Even if it seems trivial, trivial to you at the moment, just write down, this is what stuck out to me. Here's something that I didn't know before. Here's a word that really stuck out to me. You know, what, how, whatever it takes. So what, what is the thing that you are observing about that scripture? What stands out to you? Is there a part of the story? Is a part of a, uh, one of the characters in the story that, 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 that stuck out to you? That how they reacted to something? Whatever it is, what did you observe? And then you look at yourself and say, well, how does this apply to me? What should I do with this? Where do I go with this from here? What, how does this change the person that I am? How does this change the way that I relate to people and interact with people? Okay, there's your application. And then you see what the bottom one is, is prayer, which we've been talking about for the last month. Okay, taking the things that I've now observed, taking the applications and actually talking to God about them. And I know for some of you, even still praying is very really difficult, so do what David did. Just write out your prayers. If you're not sure how to speak them, just spend some time writing it out. So when it, comes to what, when it comes to setting up this discipline of meditation in your life, use the word soap to help you through. Get some scripture, write down your observations, see how it applies to your life, and then spend some time in prayer. And as you do that, hopefully what you'll start to see is you'll start to see yourself playing along with the song. Instead of just jumping into prayer and treating God like a genie in a bottle and you know, bringing him a list of complaints or whatever, how, how it's so natural for us to pray, you come to him and you allow your mind to stop and to focus on what he is saying, what it means for your life, and that can be reflected in your prayer life. So that's it. So this is what it takes to meditate um, on God's word, and that will, uh, that will really change uh, how you spend your time in prayer. Well, that's... that's uh, uh, I've, I've gone a little bit over in time, so I'm, I'm going to send you away, and I'm going to say, glad you're here. Our prayer series has ended. We're going to get back into the He Changed Everything series next week, uh, but we'll see you then.